The big question is this, how do you put your wealth in a position to last forever, no matter what happens with the economy, the markets, real estate, or the dollar? Unfortunately, most people and even experienced investors do not understand that we are not just entering into the next recession. We are entering into the largest wealth transfer and economic reset in global history. And I'm going to show you why I say that today. Because if you want your wealth to last forever, you really need to understand the hidden dangers that currently threaten your ability to do so. And further, even develop a plan that puts you on the winning side of this mess that we're in. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading since 2002. Over the course of my career, I've been a banker and a stockbroker. I was there on Black Monday in 1987, and I've been studying currency life cycles since 1989. I can tell you without a doubt, this is a fact, that there are repeatable patterns that can help us all identify the next most likely outcome. My mission is to translate financial noise into understandable language to help people like you understand what's really happening behind the scenes so that you can make those educated choices that put your best interest first. What a concept. This video in particular might just be the single most important video that I've ever created. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. Now, I would like you to know that I originally created this strategy for myself based on those repeatable patterns, but now I'm sharing it with you. Here at ITM, frankly, we have integrated the strategy into everything that we do for our clients. We believe very strongly in education and things that are fact based that I can prove, that we can prove. And we've been refining this for decades. There's a lot of material to cover here today. So let's just jump in because what I'm going to show you is why we have to have the reset and how to make your wealth last forever. First, we have to start out with an understanding of the foundation of how money functions and disappears. Then we're going to take a look at why I'm saying this must be a global reset and why it's so much bigger than just a recession. You're also going to see how the big banks and the laws have transferred risk from the few, from the elite, to the public, to the many, to you. And we're going to go over the strategy to show you how your wealth can actually last forever. We'll also take a look at the transition and where you personally will stand based upon the choices that you make. So let's just jump into the foundation. What they knew in 1913 is that people do not understand inflation and how inflation robs you of your purchasing power. So this Federal Reserve graph, you can see out of the original dollars worth of purchasing power, there is less than four cents left today. This is key because there's just not a whole lot of purchasing power to rob. And I'm going to come back to that in a future, in a slide in a few minutes. What I'd also like to show you is on this Federal Reserve graph, they place it at zero because what do they know? Over 4,800 times historically, every single fiat currency that has ever been attempted has gone to zero value. Now let's, let me explain fiat for you because the literal translation is by decree. But the bottom line is, is fiat money is government declared money. And frankly, as we saw in 2016 in India, if the government can say, oh, this is money, they can also say, oh, it is no longer money. But that's for another day. 
Now, what they know is that fiat money, or inflation rather, creates nominal confusion. Now, what's nominal confusion? Okay, you had a $20 bill 20 years ago, you got a $20 bill today. Nominally, they're identical. They are both $20 bills. But what that $20 bill bought you 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, last year, and what it buys you today is vastly different. So this is how they get to take away that purchasing power. With corporations, here's the advantage. Because people don't understand that, you give them a raise, but average wage never keeps pace with inflation. So people are willing to actually work for less, even though to them, it looks like they're working for more. Let me show you what I mean by that. Back in 1971, when we went on a full debt-based fiat system, the average wage was roughly 9,500. And a family of four could live on that. Now I'm not saying they were super wealthy, but you only needed one wage earner. Today, the average wage is something like 53,000. So of course, everybody would say, well, pff, I would much rather have 53,000 than 9,500. But we both know that 42% of the population cannot come up with $400 in an emergency. And we also know that it takes two wage earners to support a family of four. And even that, you're living it from paycheck to paycheck. Now, the way to stabilize that is with gold. So if you had been paid in gold, you would have gotten over 271 ounces. If you never got a raise, but you were still paid in the same amount of gold, that would equal $437,488.57. Now, I'm pretty sure that a family of four can live quite comfortably on over $437,000 a year. So that's how money functions and loses its value with you not even realizing it. And by the way, it's only possible on a fiat money system is this next piece that we need to talk about because it is the derivative market that, well, it froze the market in 2008 and I believe will overwhelm the central bankers and government's ability, and I'll show you why I say that in a minute, to save the economies in this next downturn. Now, a derivative is basically a big bet, but there are good kinds of derivatives. For example, way down here, this is from the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, and they run quarterly reports on derivatives in the FDIC insured banking system. And this low, the lowest green line would be an end user non-trading derivative. So here's the example. I'm a farmer and it's January and I have to deliver my crop in September, but I have no idea between now and then what the weather is going to be like, if I'm gonna have a good crop or I'm gonna have a bad crop. So I buy a derivative, a futures contract, so that in September, if there's a problem with the crop, well, I've guaranteed my income that I can survive this year and then go on to next year. If, however, there's, there is, uh, my crop is good, okay, well, then that's just an insurance policy, a cost of doing business, and the derivative goes away. That's why they say non-trading. But, of course, back in the end of the 90s, 98, they you know, again, wanting to boost the banks, they blocked oversight of OTC over-the-counter derivatives. Now, an over-the-counter derivative is an off-balance sheet transaction, which means that you really can't see what is, unless you look in the accompanying notes, if you look at the financial statement, you really have no idea what they're doing with the derivatives. And it can hide liabilities that can become, boom, immediately illiquid. 
A great example of this is what happened in 2008. It was a collateralized debt obligation, a CDO derivative of mortgages that froze. How long did it take for the market to freeze? Boom, 24 hours. Any of you people that were either getting a mortgage or in that business during that period of time will likely remember how quickly the markets seized up. Now, what you are seeing here, let me just show you this, okay? This is 2008. That's where the derivatives were in 2008. Today, we, are, we have a lot more. And in fact, in 2013, they changed some or they came up with some accounting rules called netting that makes it look a whole lot smaller than it really is. So it's clear to see that the derivative problem that happened in 2008 that collapsed the markets, well, they just papered over it. They didn't fix anything. This hasn't gone down. It's actually gone up way bigger. Now, why would that be a problem? Well, for one thing, the IMF, that's the International Monetary Fund, and all of its members are either central bank heads or uh, and treasury secretaries, actually, it's a combination of the two, from pretty much every country in the world. And they say that the large banks active in the OTC derivative market do not hold enough collateral for all the positions in their trading book. And remember, whenever you hear anything that says nominal or notional, we really don't even know the true value at risk. Admitted that the guys that created this stuff actually admit that. And they also admit that whatever collateral there, ha there is has been rehypothecated or reused. I want you to hold on to that thought on hypothecation and rehypothecation because I'm going to talk a lot more about that in just a couple of slides. But this is the problem. These are the speculative derivatives in the FDIC insured banks. So I want to give you a general idea of the scope and how large this issue is. Because what a derivative is, is leverage upon leverage upon leverage. And here you have the assets in the nine biggest banks, right here. These two nice tall buildings. But here you have the derivative bets. This is football fields, tennis fields, the White House, the buses. Can you start to see how huge this issue is. And in fact, before they change the accounting rules, the Bank for International Settlements, which is the central banker's central bank, logged in the notional value of derivatives at 1.44 quadrillion. And I saw it myself with my own eyes. Unfortunately, that was before I knew enough to, to do a screen capture. But I can tell you, 1.44 quadrillion. You know, can you see why that's an issue? Well, it's big, but this is really why it's an issue. Because all of these banks are incestuously intertwined. So that no matter where the disruption occurs, it will quickly flow through the entire global financial system. Maybe you remember in 2008 when we bailed out AIG, which was an insurance company. Why? Because they had sold a lot of derivative bets. And if they had not paid those bets off at 100%, Goldman Sachs would have gone down, everybody, JP Morgan, all of them. It, there would have been no even covering this up. So I hope you can see this is why one of the reasons, I'm going to show you more, but one of the reasons why I'm saying what we're dealing with now was just covered up in 2008. It wasn't solved, but we've taken on an awful lot of debt to do that. And here's part of the problem with that. What you're looking at is out of an annual report that is written by the, uh, by the uh, Bank of Canada, where they study sovereign debt defaults. Okay, well, sovereign 
is government. So they're talking about government debt. Now, what I'd like you to pay attention to is the red bars because the red bars represent advanced economies. Well, who's an advanced economy? The U.S. is an advanced economy. The economies in the Eurozone are advanced. Great Britain, Japan, Sweden, Switzerland, etc. Those are all advanced economies. And what do we see? Well, I hate to say this because this is really not a good thing, but since 2016, so just a few years ago, the level of government debts that are defaulting, or governments that are defaulting on their debt, increased 540% between 2016 and 2018. And from 2017 to 2018, they increased 220%. So you have to ask yourself, is this a trend and what does that mean? It means that the governments are not going to be a whole lot of help in this next crisis. That's what that means. Beyond that, they're saying, according to the Bank of Canada, that what is happening is more closely correlated with rising public debt burdens than at any time since the 1930s, than at any time since the Great Depression. Now, that's when this whole experiment kicked off. So that was the beginning. Now we're at the end. That's why it looks correlated. And let's just talk about that debt a little bit more because what you're looking here is all sectors debt and it's at $73.434 trillion. Now, there's a little something interesting because I've been working on this piece for a while. So at that time, the most current piece that I could get was Q2 of 2019. I'll show you why I left that in. So $73.4 trillion roughly in the third quarter, so one quarter, that debt ex went up over a trillion dollars to 74.559 trillion. So you see how exponentially, how quickly and straight up this debt is going. But the problem is you cannot, so think about it for yourself, you cannot solve a too much debt problem with even more debt. That would be like you taking on a credit card and maxing that thing out, going and getting another credit card so you can transfer that balance over there and then loading that credit card up again. And hey, you can keep doing it as long as somebody's going to give you credit cards. But what happens when they stop? So that is showing you that piece because in the meantime, the global GDP for all of 2019 was just a little bit more than 37 trillion. So, okay, as long as your income can grow to cover the debt, all right, well, you could keep it going, but here's the problem. We're in a global slowdown and expected income growth, GDP, which is all the money that flows throughout the global system, they only, they're, they're having trouble meeting 2%. In the meantime, they expect debt to be growing at 13.5% and maybe even faster than that. So the debt is growing faster than the income. We got a problem. If that were you, would you have a problem? Of course. And frankly, whether you're a government, a corporation or an individual, the laws of economics really work the same. The difference is, is that central banks and government have access to printing presses. But now I'm going to show you why, I've already shown you why we can't expect a whole lot of help for governments. Now I'm going to show you why we can't really expect a whole lot of help from central bankers. Yes, they do have their printing presses, but with interest rates anchored somewhere near zero and a lot in negative rate territory, that means that they're out of ammunition. And in fact, you probably have heard about negative rates, but you probably haven't experienced it yet. So let me explain that to you before we move on, because it's an important concept. A negative rate means that the lender 
is loaning money and accepting back less than they loaned. So in essence, they are paying the borrower to borrow. Does that make any sense to you? I mean, other than your children, who would you do that for? Right? Yet, the world of negative rate debt is massively on the rise. And it's coming to a theater near you. It's coming to the U.S. at some point, most likely in the next crisis. 25% of all global bonds are negative yielding. 40% of all govern, I'm sorry, 25% of all bonds are negative yielding. 40% of all government bonds are negative yielding. And 43% of non-US investment grade corporate bonds are negative yielding. And that means that these lenders, which are essentially, if you buy a bond, you're a lender, lenders are willing to take back less than what they put out to begin with. That frankly is insanity. It's just insanity. Here's something else that's been quite interesting. As negative yielding debt grows, spot gold rises with it because gold is the true flight to safety asset. Is it a negative yielding government bond that is likely to default safe? Of course it's not safe. And wait, out of the horse's mouth, This is from Mark Carney, who is the recent, he just retired, but the Bank of England chief, and he also used to be head of the Bank of Canada. And he says, if there were to be a deeper downturn that requires more stimulus than a conventional recession, then it's not clear that monetary policy would have sufficient space. No, because how far below zero can you go? Right? This is the big test that they've been experimenting with since 2009. And what they found is that it's not really getting people to borrow and spend more. Now, I should kind of back up here because interest rates are a key tool for these central bankers. If they want to stimulate spending, they lower interest rates and that's supposed to inspire people to borrow and then spend. But what's happening today in this negative yield environment is people are nervous about their future. So rather than spending, they're saving. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But they're out of tools. It's critical that you get that piece. But frankly, if you're only going to get one slide that I show you today, this would be the one for you to get because your securities and your savings are absolutely at risk. And I'm gonna show you. Remember we talked about hypothecation earlier. This is where I'm gonna show this to you. Because Yale did a study on the legal ownership of all assets that are held in street name. So if you have a brokerage account, you can call your stockbroker or you have a mutual fund or ETFs or any of that stuff. Then double check on this, but I'm going to tell you it's held in street name. And that means that you are not actually the legal owner. The legal owner is way up here and it's DTC, which is a depository for all of those intangible certificates. They created Seed and Company as well, but DTC owns them. So this up here is the legal registered owner of all of those intangible stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, etc. Now they are actually owned by their participants, which are all of those banks and brokerage houses, plus stock exchanges, investment companies, and retail investment banks. So they are also frankly classified as beneficial owners as are all of their subsidiaries and there can be a lot of subsidiaries. So where do you fit in this picture? We haven't seen you yet. Oh, here you are down at the bottom. And guess what? You too are a beneficial owner. 
Now let's examine those benefits a little bit. The benefit to anybody between DTC and you on the bottom is that they get to utilize your equity on their behalf. That is called hypothecation. But if they write this contract through the city of London, which is where most of them are written, then there are no limits to the number of entities that get to use your equity over and over and over again. So no limits to the number of entities and no limits to the number of times that that equity can be used. That is rehypothecation, which is what the IMF was talking about in that earlier slide. And they state it quite clearly. You do not have to take my word for anything. Follow the links. Do your own due diligence. Street name holders are not technically entitled to vote shares or grant proxy authority. Those rights reside with DTC as the legal owner of all street name shares. But they don't want you to know that. So they pass along the dividends. They pass along the proxies. They pass this along so that your perception is that you own something. But the legal reality, which is only what counts in a court of law, is that you do not. You are not the legal registered owner. You are the beneficial owner. So if you think back to what happened in 2008 with that massive amount of wealth transfer, who went to jail? Nobody. Because even though what they did was disgusting, despicable evil, it was not illegal. So that's how your, any of the wealth that you hold in the stock or the bond or even the REITs in the intangible Wall Street markets, that's how that's at risk. And, and remember, I can only do the tip of the iceberg. Now I'm going to show you how your savings account, your checking account is also at risk. Because in 95, the government's legalized a sweep program, a deposit sweep program. This is called deposit reclassification. And what it does is it enables the bank, when after you make a deposit into your checking or savings account, the bank has the right to sweep that money into sub accounts that is in their name. And once it's there, well, they can lend it out, but they can also go out and do derivatives with it. They can do anything that they want with it. And so that brought in the need for the bail-in laws, which in the U.S. was legalized in 2010. And then it was tested in Cyprus in 2013. You and I as depositors are classified as sticky, which means that when we make that deposit, we are not likely to move that deposit or withdraw it really fast. So in Cyprus, which is where they tested this, this red line are depositors. So way up here, they're depositors. This black line are foreign banks, mostly German and French. Well, after Cyprus joined the EU, you can see, and they were paying higher interest rates, so you can see the German and French banks piled into them. But in 2010, they knew the system was already falling apart. So they got out, leaving the depositors to hold the bag. Now, at first, they wanted to do it without a recognizing deposit insurance. But the whole world went crazy and said, oh, what about deposit insurance? What about deposit insurance? And so they then backed up and they honored the deposit insurance by leaving in there the 100,000 uh, euros and under. But people did not even have access to that. They had limited access to their money on a daily basis. So the Bank for International Settlements, the biz, came up with a global blueprint and they did it with and without deposit insurance. Now, frankly, they call that deposit insurance a scheme and it is a scheme. It's a scheme about making sure that you have confidence and hold your wealth in the system. But there are many people that have subsequently discovered that it's not really to your benefit. 
And it's been tested not just in Cyprus, but also in Portugal, in Italy, in many places just not here in the U.S. And essentially what the bail-in laws allow is that deposits, CDs, bonds in the banks, all of these can be converted into shares of stock in a failing bank. And you say, well, how can they do that? Well, that's about the eminent domain laws. They can't just take your money. They have to leave you something and supposedly of equal value. But who gets to determine what the value of stock in a failing bank is? Hmm, the failing bank. Let that sink in for a minute. Because frankly, that's crazy. Why would you trust them? There have been many that have to their detriment. So the laws are in place, tip of the iceberg. There's so much more, watch the rest of my videos, you'll see. But there, the laws are in place. They have been tested. I think in this case, they are ready for this next financial crisis. But you know, I really wouldn't be showing you all these dangers if I didn't have a solution for you. So I've shown you why it has to be a reset. Governments and central banks are out of tools. They're in trouble themselves. I also showed you how the laws have been put in place to rob you of your wealth. Now I am going to show you our strategy because it really entails four areas. And the first is wealth protection. You've got to protect because not everybody can even withdraw their money or their wealth from the stock markets. I mean, if you're in a 401k, or a 403B, certainly, unless you're, as long as you're still contributing, you're not going to be able to touch that money. So you want to be able to protect it as well. Here, I'm going to give you a little hint. You need physical gold and silver. And at ITM Trading, this is our specialty, physical, that you hold. And we specialize in these custom strategies that I'm showing you right now. Okay, so we want to protect the wealth first. Then we want to make sure that you can sustain your current standard of living. In addition to that, we want to be in a position to take advantage of opportunities that present. Because today, so much of what you, have you seen the massive building that's going on out there? All of that is done with leverage which means that all of that is most likely to come back on the market at a much lower level. In fact, in Japan, commercial real estate dropped 95%. Think about that. So we want to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. And finally, we want you to be able to build a legacy so that not only does this wealth last your lifetime, but that you get to pass it down to generations, uh, my children, my grandchildren, maybe even my great-grandchildren. If you are in the right place at the right time with the right asset, then you are going to have the ability to leave that legacy. And you can also, if you've got that plan in place and you've got everything built out, well, that gives you all the personal confidence that you need in a secure financial future in something that has been tested over many, many thousands of years. Because let's face it, financial shields are made of physical metals, not paper, gold and silver. So now we have to look at what happens if you make educated choices, you do your own due diligence, you make educated choices, and you have the ability to convert into income producing assets and carry on. Because over 6,000 years, physical gold has absolutely been a store of value. 6,000 years ago, you could buy a beautiful suit of armor with one ounce of gold. At the beginning of this experiment, 
in the early 1900s, you could have bought a great man suit with a one ounce gold coin or a $20 bill. And that one ounce gold coin was a $20 gold coin. Today, if you still had that ounce of gold, and this is, is actually spot gold is up from here, but on the 7th of February, when I created this slide, it was at 1,573 bucks. And I'm pretty darn sure that you can still buy a very nice man suit with 1,573 bucks. What you're looking at here is official central bank gold holdings. From the third quarter, this is the most current data I could get, third quarter of 2000 to the third quarter of 2019. And here we are in 2010 when the central banks, well, first they slowed down their selling and then they speeded up their buying. And guess what? They are buying more gold today than the history since they've been tracking how much central banks are buying gold. Why? Because they know everything and so much more that I just showed you. And whoever holds their purchasing power, well, guess what? Then you can convert it into the new currency. You can convert it into income producing assets when they're a bargain. And you're, you're actually could be in better condition and better shape than before the crisis even hit. They want to stay in power. And they know that whoever holds the gold retains purchasing power. They know that. Those that understand money own gold. And if you don't understand anything else, you might want to take a page out of the smartest guys in the room on money's playbook. Who knows more than central banks? And they're buying gold. I think you need to, too. I know I am. I totally know I am. Because if you don't do anything, well, you know what's going to happen. The value of that fiat money will continue to decline until it loses every bit of value. And there's only four cents left. And what happens with all of those stocks and bonds and ETFs and all that crap, that intangible stuff that you can only convert into dollars, well, they disappear. So far, the genius of this new experiment was controlling the rate and speed of inflation. But they're at the end and they're out of tools. So, so far it's happened slow, but the next event will make it happen very rapidly. And I'm thinking you might want to be ready for that. It's up to you because this is what it looks like if you just sit and watch and you do nothing. You're going to have to start over from zero. In Venezuela, that currency has more value as a napkin for an empanada than as a tool of barter. And in fact, the Venezuelan stock market has repeatedly had the best stock market in the world since 2012 because of the hyperinflation. But look at what happened to the market when they reset and lopped off zeros. Bam. So any wealth that's held in those hyperinflated markets, they keep saying, well, where'd all the inflation go? We don't have any inflation. Yeah, yeah, we do. In the stock market, in the bond market, in the real estate market, in those markets that they targeted, and when I say they, I mean the central bankers, that they targeted for reflation. Have you heard about the reflation trade? It's just throwing more and more worthless paper at it, but it does not last forever. The truth is, is that 2008 was just a warning. The system died in 2008. Look at my other videos. No doubt about it. And all they've done is inflate, reinflate the markets to cover it up. As you saw, they did nothing to fix the problem. Nothing. And all of this is why I'm telling you that the next financial crisis equals a monetary a financial system reset. And it's not just, frankly, me telling you. 
the central bankers have been calling for a reset as well. So the choice is yours. You can do whatever you want and you certainly have to do what you're comfortable with. But here at ITM, we have a strategy and it is based upon repeatable patterns. And we're here to be of service.